I've wanted to have our guest on the season with Peter Schrager every week this season and every week in the off season, it hasn't come together. And then this week I begged him considering the storylines at play and his vantage point at what I would imagine is the wild card game of the weekend. The one that I'm most excited for it's taking place Sunday night. It's in Detroit. It's their first home playoff game in 30 years. And Oh, who's coming to town. Sean McVay, Matthew Stafford, and the Los Angeles Rams. Uh, this is the president of the Los Angeles Rams. For my money, maybe the smartest guy that I deal with on a day-to-day -day basis or a week-to-week -week basis or in any conversations that we have, I feel like he's got the best 30,000-foot view of the league and always provides insights and has done wonders in Los Angeles for this franchise. How's that for an intro? Kevin Demoff, president of the Rams. What's up, buddy? I think we're, I think I should just end on that note, right? That's the mic drop of, uh, I've wanted to do the podcast too, though. So this is, we finally had a reason uh, to do it as we sit here on a wild card weekend. What a fun, it's such a crazy time of year in the NFL. You have 14 teams excited about wild card weekend and then probably the other half for, you know, dealing with something crazy on their own. So it's probably my favorite time of year in the NFL, just from a sheer, you know, excitement and interest. Yeah, I think that's 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 where we're at. And like today on Good Morning Football, we started the show and we talked Belichick and then we went into uh, Wink Martindale and then we went into Kirk Cousins' contract and we had a bunch of viewers being like, hello, there's 14 teams playing football, but that's the crux right now. It's like we're at this intersection of teams trying to rebuild and do it on the fly in January. And then the rest of the league who's still around actually trying to compete for a Super Bowl title. Let's start with the latter with you. Um, this is, to me, this is Goff versus the Rams. This is Stafford versus the Lions. This is McVay versus Goff. This is, oh, storylines that are so rich and so seeped into personal intersections. You are the president of the Los Angeles Rams. You were the president of the Los Angeles Rams when they drafted Jared Goff out of Cal, first overall, trading up to get him. And then you were the president of the Rams when you traded Jared Goff for Matthew Stafford. Let's go into the Jared and Matthew, uh, you know, storyline. Let's start with the Jared Goff storyline and where the Rams and you personally stand as you look to travel to Detroit to face the guy that you guys took out of college and then eventually shipped off to go get Stafford. Where do you stand as far as Jared goes and his relationship to the Los Angeles Rams franchise? Well, look, I, I love the idea of Matthew Stafford coming back to Detroit to play in the playoff game. I just wish it wasn't against Jared Goff. Right. Like for, for me personally, uh, I think for our franchise, if there's one person outside of our 53 players I pull for on Sundays, it's Jared. And, hmm. you know, means so much to our franchise. He's the first pick we trade up in 2016. He's the first pick of the Los Angeles Rams in the, this era of 2016. You know, I remember sitting down with him after the 2016 season when we made the coaching change and him looking at me and saying, this will never happen again. I will promise you we will get this fixed. And we hire Sean the next year. We go to the playoffs we win the division. Jared goes to the pro bowl. We have the number one offense in the NFL a year later. We're in the super bowl. You know, we went from two years of sitting in my office saying, I promise you, I will get this fixed to being in the super bowl. And that was, you know, largely the Sean Jared pairing Jared's leadership. And I know it didn't end the way we all wanted to with Jared delivering a super bowl to Sanders, but Three playoff appearances in four years, two division titles, a Super Bowl, and just one of the best human beings you'll ever meet. And, you know, when the trade went down, you know, my two kids were at the time probably 11 and 9 on the floor in tears crying. Hmm. You know, their, their favorite player ever. Hmm. And still cheer for, for Jared. Um, you know, my daughter will still text with him you know, every now and then. And like, this is just one of the people you will root for every day of the week and just maybe not Sunday at 8 p.m. I hear you. I hear you. I, let's, because, I, you know, there's like this like Rams legacy of Jared Goff and you'd hate to think the legacy of Jared Goff is the Rams trading him to Detroit. No, I remember NFC Championship game in New Orleans down 13 nothing, and this guy grits out a victory. I remember Seattle during the COVID season, he comes off the bench with about nine fingers because one of them was broken, and he beats Russell Wilson in his building. If you can encapsulate the good of Jared Goff during his Rams career, it was really, really good. There's a picture right outside my office of him doing the finger roll on Monday Night Football after he ran in the ball 
you know, in that epic game against the Chiefs. Like, I remember that. I remember, you know, one of the greatest passing performances I've ever seen Thursday night against the Vikings, Mm -hmm. you know, on Thursday night football when, you know, the first primetime game, you know, regular season at the Coliseum, you know, just all the good he did donating backpacks during the pandemic uh, to kids in need in Inglewood who had no Wi-Fi, who had no backpacks. I mean, if you needed something, Jared Goff was there. If you needed a community event for the, what he did for South LA, Watts, Inglewood, and, and those kids, for what he did for our football team, for what he did for our fans, like he's awesome. Like there's, you know, simply put in what he's doing in Detroit, you see it on a daily basis, both on the field and off the field. He encapsulates what you want in, in a franchise quarterback to represent you know, your organization and look all, I think all of these players now in this era of social media and, you know, immense focus on the NFL, they go through ups and downs. Um, and, you know, when I talked to him the day after the trade that night, I should say one of the hardest conversations you ever had, like this person was single-handedly responsible, you know, along with our coaching staff for getting us, you know, on the map in Los Angeles. So, you know, you can never boil it down to, could they make a play? Could they do X, Y, and Z? You know, that diminishes so much of who Jared Goff is and what he brings uh, to his teams in this league. I go back to the drafting of Goff because I think we forget now that it's been seven years ago, but you guys were not a top five pick. You trade up and then you work out Jared Goff. And I remember this from, I think, a Mike Silver article that ran on like NFL.com whipping rains like the scene was set and jeff fisher lays eyes on him and sees him throwing in the rain when they said maybe we should postpone it and Goff says no let me throw today in horrible weather and he just like can't miss do you do you you were there that day right were you present yeah i remember landing in oakland you know and into a driving rainstorm we go to the hotel and we're like you know we we can postpone this until because it was early march Mm -hmm. you know we hadn't even made the trade really at that time we just thought we might um, and so we went to work out Carson Wentz and Jared Goff on back-to-back days and it's pouring rain. We're like, we'll do this another time. We'll come back. And I think you have to go back in time. I think there was something about Jared having small hands at the combine. Yeah. He was, he was one of the initial, you know, Kenny Pickett, small hands guys. And so, <laughs> you know, the rain and all this, and he's like, no, I want to go throw. And so, so we go throw and he's on the field. Now I'm, you know, I was a little bit of a wimp after like the first 10 minutes. Yeah, I went go stood. inside, of course. I, I went and stood in the tunnel and watched. Um, yeah. But he's driving the ball. He's throwing it great. And you walked away from from that experience being like, okay, like this guy can, can throw it, you know, great leader, great personality. You just connected with him and, you know, fearless. And I think that was always the one thing about Jared. There was never a challenge he thought that was, was too big. And you look at what he did at Cal, turn that f- program around for, I think, 0-11 to get in them in the armed forces bowl. He comes to the Rams. We go from four and 12 and destitute to in the Super Bowl. You look at what he's done at Detroit. This is a person who knows how to turn franchises around. I, I, I think about golf and it's like, you know, he, we saw him on hard knocks the first year with you guys, when William Hayes is talking about dinosaurs, we see him on hard knocks the second year when you guys are with the chargers doing joint hard knocks. And then he gets a, a year with the lions so it's like we've had three experiences on Hard Knocks. That's like 18 episodes of Hard Knocks. Like, okay, I get the Jared Goff thing. And then this year, I don't know if you saw this, he was doing Thursday night football, the Lions win, they bring him on. And before the Thursday night game, Fitzpatrick said he's a poor man's Matt Ryan, to which Jared Goff went out of his way on the panel and looked at Fitzpatrick and was like, I'm a poor man's nobody. Like, what? And he was, and I'm like, oh, there's some edge to Jared Goff. So he's not this pushover. He's not this guy that just gets a beating in the media and takes it. It was the first time I've seen him publicly respond to some criticism or respond to those saying he can't get over the hump. Uh, did you see that side of Jared Goff? And is that just a side that people take for granted and say, oh, he's just a nice guy and Stafford's got the edge, but Goff doesn't have that in him? Uh, Jared has an edge. Like it may be harder to find. You don't see it every day, but he's competitive. You know, and he believes in himself and he believes in his teammates. And, and I always feel bad. You know, the first hard knocks, I think people went out of their way to portray him as a kind of clueless rookie so that to show, OK, he's far away and he's not going to start um, the season. I don't think that that was fair to Jared or, or the narrative. Um, and look, as much as I love hard knocks, you can still have some element of reality TV when you're with a team 24 seven, what you choose to show and what you don't. And I always thought that was a really unfair narrative, you know, for him. Um, but I think his personality, he's laid back. He's California. 
you know, and, and people sometimes mistake that for being nonchalant. He's not nonchalant. Um, now he's not your, your high strung either. He, he can be a great balance of, of the two. And I think he's found that mix as he's gone through his career. Where were you for the trade? I remember the stories where McVeigh was in Cabo and he's texting you guys. And then Stafford is also in Cabo and there's not tampering going on because the lions were like, you're open to search for a trade. There's all these different teams involved. And then it goes down and it's like, wow, this is really happening. And I know someone has to make that call to Jared Goff. And this is fresh off a playoff appearance against the Seahawks now loss in green Bay. Um, where were you during all that? And what are your memories of really executing what was at the time considered the trade of the, the decade? I mean, we, we lost to, you know, we start John Wolford in the wild card game against Seattle. Jared had broken his thumb two weeks earlier uh, in Seattle. John gets a concussion. Jared's got to go back in, you know, eight, nine days after surgery, you know, finds a way to get us to win. We score 31 points, which is unbelievable. We go in the next week to green Bay, um, play well, but lose. They were the number one seed uh, that year. So we fly home. You kind of go through the end of the year stuff. And, you know, Sean goes to Cabo, uh, runs into Matthew Stafford. That story is kind of well known. But it's really the first weekend we've had off since July. And so you're trying to get a little bit as far away from football. Yeah. And you still have the conference championship games that, that weekend. But you're trying to take a break from football. Your family hasn't seen you. And I really remember about 8 a.m. that morning, you know, Les Sneed, our GM, had talked to Brad Holmes and he said, this thing could go down today. So I hunkered down in my home office, you know, all day and, you know, kind of just progressed throughout the day. And you're like, I thought this would take two to three weeks. It's happening. You know, post Super Bowl, you know, we're, you know, hey, you go to the Super Bowl this day, you know, and, and I think one of the things that happened is there was a report Friday afternoon that we were interested in Stafford because it had come out to the lines and we're giving them the permission to have a trade. And at that time, and still, I think we work so quickly, last Sean, our organization, that all the teams that were kind of sniffing around Stafford at the time, Washington, Carolina, Indianapolis, uh, got aggressive. And that really drove the trade. Um, and, you know, once that happened, it was going to be within 24 hours. And so, you know, less at 8 a.m., you go to sit in your home office. And I think the trade got done at 6.45 p.m. Yeah. Done. Uh, and then Stafford comes along. And now what does this mean, you think, for Matthew? Have you spoken to him this week going back to Detroit where he played for, what is it, 13 seasons? He was a he was a Detroit Lion. And then he comes over to the L.A. Rams, wins a Super Bowl. And now he's going back there to hopefully, for you guys, spoil their first home game in 30 years in the playoffs. Yeah, you know, I, I haven't asked him about it. I'm sure no one will ask Matthew at all this week yeah. about yeah, what's sure going on. Not a topic. To, not a topic. To, you know, but I, I think it's probably different for him, right? Like, you get traded to Los Angeles, you win a Super Bowl, two playoff appearances in, in three years. He, you know, you go back to 2021, he had the monkey on his back of couldn't win never a playoff won, game. He hasn't won a playoff game, then he wins four. I think he's now the second leading quarterback behind like Patrick Mahomes in terms of playoff wins. Is that right? Joe, Flac Joe, Joe Flacco may now have him beat, right? Like yeah. I, I didn't, that wasn't in my, you know, bingo card a month ago. But, <laughs> um, you know, I, I think for Matthew, it's going to be the, you know, probably the weight of the expectations from his time in Detroit and, and trying to go flip that franchise. Um, but I think probably from a Rams perspective, I would imagine this is probably a little bit harder for Jared than it is for Matthew, just from my perspective of, Hey, you got to go win the playoff game. You got to go advance in the playoffs. You know, I mean, I think you know there will be talk this week who won the trade. Um, and I think it's a true, I said, you know, it's a win-win. We won the Super Bowl. Matthew's done a great job for us. We're thrilled to have him. I don't think there's anybody else, you know, we'd rather have. Obviously, Jared and the Lions have had great success, not only with Jared, with the picks they got. And I think it's great for once to see a trade in the NFL work out for both sides. Right. You know, and that people don't have to, you know, pick a winner or a loser. Uh, but I'm sure for Matthew, it'll be meaningful. I think he said, you know, the, hey, once it kicks off, it's football. It'll be interesting. That building will be rocking. You got to know. Oh, my gosh. Thir 30 years. That place is always rocking. And, you know, so 30 years they've been waiting for this moment in prime time. Uh, I can't wait. It'll be an unbelievable atmosphere. Yeah, no, and we'll watch it. And Tariko, who lives in Ann Arbor, Michigan, is going to be on the call. Like, there's a lot of cool symmetry here between the two franchises. On this podcast, as you know, we talk to coaches. We talk to GMs. There's also this other wrinkle. Brad Holmes, who's the general manager and the architect of this amazing Lions roster, 
he comes from the Rams also. And you guys helped nurture him. And we had him on the podcast. And he has nothing but glowing stories about his time working under Lesson in L.A. I mean, how impressed are you with what Brad's done in Detroit? So impressed. And, you know, what I love about Brad is, you know, and it's great for people to remember this time of year when everybody's throwing around candidate names. Nobody was talking about Brad Holmes, you know, in 2021. And really, you know, I remember trying to sell him to the Lions, less trying to sell him to the Lions. You know, the Falcons had a little bit of interest. The Lions really did. And once they interviewed him, they were excited. And what I love about the Lions is they've been built in a fearless manner. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, you go against the grain and you draft Jameer Gibbs, you draft, you know, Jack Campbell. You know, they have not just followed what I would call the normal NFL script. And I I think if there's some piece of DNA Brad Holmes has from the Rams, it's be yourself, be different. You know, you can't win in this league following the same blueprint everybody else does. It's impossible. No organization, no team is good enough to do the same things everybody else does and just be better at all of them. You have to pick a lane to go be different. And, and that's what I've loved about how Brad and, you know, and Dan Campbell have built the Lions. They've done it in a uniquely Lions way. And that's what makes it really hard to play them, to beat them, to compete with them, because they're zigging when everybody else is zagging. Yeah. And I, I think, you know, if anything was the foot, the was the Rams was, well, you know, F these, F these picks. And it was like, let's go get these veterans for years. And then for Brad Holmes, to your point, drafting a running back and an inside linebacker with two first round picks was F your draft guide. And I, I love that about them. And the fact that they hired Dan Campbell, who was a tight ends coach and wasn't exactly the first in line as the hot new coordinator. And he's been perfect for them. Um, top to bottom. I know you respect a bunch of franchises. You have to, as the Rams are looked at as one of the crown jewel franchises in the NFL and how they've been built and how you guys have operated, you've got to look at Detroit and say they're right there too. I, I, when you look at what Detroit's done and, you know, I think starts with Sheila and kind of trusting, you know, from Rod Wood, Mike Disner, who I think is one of the smartest executives in the NFL. I love Brad. You know, I, I probably like everybody else in the world. I didn't know what to make of Dan Campbell at the time he got hired. Yeah. Uh, but having done coaching searches, people always spoke reverentially about Dan Campbell and, you know, what they've built, what they've done, obviously Ben Johnson. I really like Aaron Glenn, you know, always done a nice job. Like they have a really good, solid franchise. Um, and I think when you, you know, what their success is not just because they've had picks, it's because, you know, they had a plan, they went and executed it. And that's what you love to see in the NFL is when someone says, okay, we've got a plan, we're going to go build it whether it's patient or not. And look, I think you get back to where we started this show. The great part about right now is there are 14 teams that are in the playoffs with hope. There are also a whole 10 other franchises probably now that their fans have hope for the first time in months. Hey, we have a high draft pick. We're getting a new coach. We're getting a new mm -hmm. GM. You, most of the league right now is in the hope phase and that's the best phase of the NFL. And, you know, the, the Ram story, you know, from 2016 on, you know, when we were one of the worst franchises, you know, on the field in the NFL, in the Lions, that's what makes fans, that's what makes the NFL the best product. How quickly you can turn it and become one of the special franchises in the league. All right, let's go back to 2016. Uh, Fisher's fired midway through the season. Golf finishes it out. Who was the interim coach? Bones, Bones, uh, Bones John, Fossil? John Fossil, yeah. Okay, so John Fossil. And now you're starting from scratch. You're new in LA and you've got to go on a coaching search. And right now there are seven teams who are about to start their coaching search. You guys looked at this thing, having done it already, when you got Fisher a couple of years back. Take us through the coaching search and how you ended up with Sean McVay, a 30-year-old head coach coming to Los Angeles. Yeah, I think it really starts with you have to go back to the coaching search in, you know, in 2012. So I, when I got to the Rams, I was hired a couple of weeks after they'd hired Steve Spagnuolo, who I love and, you know, would love to see get another head coaching opportunity. When we made the change uh, with Steve after three years, I remember writing a note to myself, don't wait until, you know, Black Monday, hmm. you know, when you, because there's so much craziness that happens at the end of the season and you find yourself behind in the coaching search. And to be fair, you can't call, you can't really do homework on other people. You can't, you got to be all in for your current staff. And so I remember that note. So as it got to the point, you know, we had started three and one in 2016, had a pretty good start. And then, you know, we were four and 10, four and 11. You know, we decided to make the change. I remember with Jeff, we were going to go play the Seahawks on a Thursday night football. Okay. And if he had lost that game, he would have set the NFL record for losses. And, you know, we just kind of said, 
Now, I don't think it's fair to him to break the record for losses. Hmm. And you also don't want to go into a Thursday night where the whole conversation is, you know, are they making a change? What are they going to do? How is this going to go? And so we made the change on a short week. But what that really did is that gave us a month hmm. to really investigate our franchise you know, when you change a head coach, everybody just blames the coach. It is an organizational failure. Really go dig into your franchise. What's working? What's not? What's on the coaches? What's on the organization? What's on the personnel side? You know, what do you need to fix to get ready? But also to go do a deep dive on all of these coaching candidates, because you may go in with a leader, mm -hmm. um, you know, at the time and what you want to do, but you're going to go meet people. You're going to go investigate people. And so we made calls you know, really for a month, it was myself, Les Need, Tony Pastor, who works with us, just doing as much homework as we can on, on candidates. And, you know, I would say, you know, we started with a list that was 40 or 50 people just trying to get information. Um, and, you know, you try to whittle it down, whittle it down so that when you get to this phase, you know, the post Black Monday, when you can start to do interviews, that you, you know, hey, these are the eight to 10 people we really want to talk to, we have the most interest in. And it's not just guessing because, you know, you get these calls uh, out of the blue. You, you make a change and you would be amazed who calls, right? You know, and you're talking like it, a random college coach that you never thought yeah. would even be available. It's like, hey, I'm interested. Yeah. You know, like, you know, Vince Lombardi's ghost and yeah. Bo Schembechler, <laughs> you know, you know, Eric Parsegan are like, hey, you know, I haven't coached in 20 years. But, but you know, I you're, like L.A. <laughs> yeah. and, and I think you have to go back in time to you know, we were new in LA, we had all this fanfare and we just stunk. I mean, we we're the 32nd offense. We we're four and 12 and, you know, a fan base felt like it was dwindling and people thought we needed to make a big splash. Mm -hmm. And I think there was an element of us that we definitely thought about that, but it's like, okay, go through and find the coach who, who is the best fit for your organization at this time. You know, winning the press conference is great. Selling tickets is great, but if it doesn't work and you're back here in two to three years, you've already screwed up. Mm -hmm. And if you could find someone you could really grow with and, you know, who would be uniquely ours, you, you would go through that. And that was kind of the guiding principle. And I give Stan Kroenke, our owner, a ton of credit who understood the pressure, you know, about to build a stadium. You got to go sell seat licenses and suites. But, you know, he had always had this belief that, hey, let's go get the right coach for the LA Rams. And, you know, so we had that month to do homework. And, you know, I'm not ashamed. You and I chatted during that month. And it's like you're trying to pick everybody's brain, you know what do you know about these candidates? And one of the things we did, and one of the reasons you and I would always talk is, you know, media members who sit in production meetings with coaches. Talk about it. It was one of the way we call it every, you know, network person we knew. Tell us who makes you sit up straighter in your chair. Tell us who grabs your attention. Cause they talk to coordinators every week and they talk to coordinators. That to me was a way to find out a little bit more beyond, you know, and everybody kind of said, you know, Sean McVay, Sean McVay. And we would ask a question at the end of every conversation. Who's, Who's the coach nobody's talking about who's going to be a superstar? And I would say 90% of the time, the answer was Sean McVay. And who are you talking when you ask that? Like, I don't think it's, it's you talk to me about this. Probably I would imagine other guys in the media, like Schefter probably got asked. Yeah. And then all the, all the guys who call the games, probably Aikman. Yeah. yeah I talked to Joe Buck, Al Michaels, Mike yeah. Tirico, you know, who at the time was at ESPN, you know, Gruden at the time, Collinsworth. We talked to all of them you know, just to get a, get a sense. And then you, you go through your normal channels, you know, we were fortunate. We picked the brains of, you know, some of our, our legends, you know, as well, you know, we made calls to, you know, successful P GMs who had done the search and kind of, you know, the Tony Dungeons of the world, just to get a sense when you have time, mm -hmm. you can make, you can be thorough. Um, that's where Sean's name came up every time. And everybody go in two to three years, he's going to be great. You down know? the line. He'll be great, but not yet. Two, down yeah. the line. Yeah. And you know, and I'm thinking to myself, well, two to three years, if we're doing the search again, it's not me, it's someone else, right? Like yeah. we're all fired and, you know, and so we moved Sean kind of to the top of our curious list. And, and I remember vividly, they were at the time, they were supposed to be the sixth seed. They go into the giants. This is the Washington Redskins. They had a week 17 game against a giants team that had nothing to play for, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Not nothing to play for. Um, I think the Giants already clinched. That was, I want to say that's the year they went on the boat. The, the boat trip. This is the boat yeah, trip. The boat game. trip. Yeah. But they yeah, eliminated so the, the Redskins <laughs> in that win. So they eliminate the Redskins and they score seven points. And, you know, that put Detroit into the playoffs. Yep. And at the time we were looking, I think, at both Detroit coordinators. Uh, and so now they can't interview that week. 
and Sean comes available. We were expecting Meanwhile, Sean Sean's couldn't... coming off a seven point effort against yeah. a meaningless Giants team. Not exactly something you say to the local fan base. Hey, look what we just got. Correct. And, you know, the local fan base, by the way, thinks, you know, we're going to hire Bill Walsh's head coach. Yep. And, you know, Mike Shanahan is offensive coordinator. <laughs> yep. Nick Saban is defensive coordinator. And you know what? We'll let Belichick do special teams. Like that was their vision for, you know, what the 2017 LA Rams were going to do. And, and so I remember we flipped it. I called Sean Monday morning and I said, Hey, you know, and he and I had been together on staff in Tampa in 2008, but if we had talked five times, yeah. then that might, that might be a lot. Um, and I said, want to get you out to LA for an interview Wednesday or Thursday. And he's like, I scored, se- you know, typical Sean, I scored seven points. Yesterday. You know what? You want me? <laughs> Why are you calling me? And, you know, so we got him lined up and, you know, we had five or six interviews in LA that week. Um, and he comes out Wednesday and you go in to that meeting saying, how on earth can we hire a 30 year old head coach? And I would say, you walk out being, how on earth do we not hire that guy? Yes. And so we, you know, he crushes the interview. Um, and we kind of look at him and say, Hey, can you stay? We call Jared Goff and we're like, Hey, can you come meet, you know, with Sean and they come meet, they headed off. Sean's brought his computer. He's showing film of Jared and what they can do together. So then we're like, well, we got to do something else. So, you know, we kind of keep him in town. We take him to dinner with all of our wives and, you know, just you hit it off, but he was number five in the search and you still wanted to go do kind of the thorough search. We flew to New England. We met with both Josh McDaniels and Matt Patricia. Yeah. We, we flew to Florida and finished with Anthony Lynn and, and Doug Marone, you know, and, and, and the thing is at the time, no one else had interviewed Sean. Right. So you kind of feel like you've got this yeah. you know, gem, gem no one's talking about. <laughs> and then, you know, so I remember Sunday night we finished with, you know, the interview, you know, in Florida. And I, at that time, the Niners decide they're going to interview Sean. And his grandpa um, was the GM there. You're like, oh, you know, and, you know, you kind of you kind of keep track of all of this. And so I call him and I said, hey, I want you to come back out to L.A., uh, meet with the owner and all of us again. I said, I know you're interviewing with the Niners tomorrow. Do well, but not too well. Mm-hmm. You know, and whatever you do, do not accept the job on the spot. So we're flying back on Monday and we're flying back and texting him. Are you out of the meeting? Hey, what time? Can we... Three hours, four hours, nothing. And I'm fuming. We're on this yeah. plane and, and I'm looking at Les and Tony and I'm, I'm losing. How do we my let sh- him? How do we let him leave the building? Yeah. I, I'm, I'm losing my, right? Like, I can't believe we just didn't offer this to him, you know, we should have done this. And what was crazy about the search was, you know, on the plane ride, we'd now done our 10 interviews and we're comparing notes. We all had Sean number one. Mm-hmm. We all had different number twos and threes. Mm-hmm. Like not even like, so hey, the backup I have, plan wasn't even unanimous. We didn't have a backup plan. Like we were like, what do we do if he says no? And we're like, we finally, we stop in Texas mm-hmm. um, to refuel and finally get a hold of him. And he's like, I crushed him. I'm like, you still on the plane? He's like, oh yeah, I'll see you, you know, tomorrow. And so now, but the crazy part about this too, is we land back in LA and I go to dinner that night with our owner, Stan Kroenke, and he's owned multiple teams, had great success, but he's always had veteran head coaches. Yeah. So you think about Arson Wenger at Arsenal, legendary coach, George Carl, Jeff Fisher, you know, Joel Quenville, like, and you go through all the sports and you're like, Hey, I really think the best person is this 30 year old you've never heard of. You've and we're watching who just lost to the Giants yeah. in week seven. Who just lost to the Giants. The and, yeah, isn't playing in the playoffs. And we're watching the Clemson, Alabama national championship game and Hunter Renfro and Deshaun Watson score. And I'm like, look, we'll go to dinner tomorrow to to do it. And what I what I also remember at the same time, we get back to LA and uh I walk back in the office and Joanna Hunter, who works for us, um, who, who helps run our communications along with Artist Twyman. And she's like, you know, you everybody thinks you, Tony, and Les are morons. Mm. And you've never won anything. And you're running this coaching search. And everybody else is hiring consultants. And now there are all these rumors you want to hire a 30-year-old. Like, do you guys know what you're doing? I love this. And I'm like, I think we do, but maybe not. And she's like, you know, you should get some other validation before you do this. And so I sit down and I think, you know, all right. I love that Joanna is is in the office and she's like, someone's got to be a voice of reason here. And she well, and anybody who knows Joanna, she's always the voice. She'll of tell reason. you. She'll yeah, tell she'll, you. Yeah. You know, and 
And so she goes, what about someone like Marshall Falk? And I'm like, Marshall thinks we should hire a veteran coach. So I call him and I'm like, no, no, I'm not going to do this. And like, we all do our best thinking in the shower the next morning. I'm showering. I'm like, you know what? She's right. So I call Marshall. I'm like, Hey, we're going to dinner tonight. Stan, myself, Sean, would you join? And he goes, Oh, I'd love to. He goes, but you should hire a veteran coach. Like you need offense. You do this. I'm like, that's why you're perfect. You don't believe in this guy. Mm -hmm. So we, and you know, there's been a lot made, you know, the Spago story has been written. That's after the fact, right? Or is that, that's, that's the next night. So, so we go to dinner and and Marshall was walking in and he's telling Stan like, Hey, I really appreciate be coming, but like, I don't believe in this kid, whatever, you know, Sean and Marshall knock it out of the park. They hit it like off they, right they, away. Yeah. And, and they took two of the smartest football people you ever meet. Oh, right? Marshall was, Falk is brilliant. You listen to talk football, Marshall Falk, like he, he could be an NFL head coach right now yeah. if he wanted and, to be. Yeah. And he, he walks out of dinner and he turns to Stan and he goes, if you got, you let that guy leave the building, you know, shame on you. Oh. Um, and that's, you know, that's how we wound up hiring Sean. But I would tell you like running a coaching search are the two most grueling weeks probably of your life. Um, and I'm so glad the NFL has now stretched out the calendar to allow for better decision-making because it, it is really hard and intense and a, and a drain on your organization. But the one thing, you know, that you go through, you meet all these people, you get a chance to build all these, yeah. you know, great relationships. Um, you know, and, and I'll tell a funny story coach. We saw this year at one point, we interviewed in our head coaching search who kept calling uh, Tony Pastores, who works with us, he kept calling him by the wrong first name the whole interview. Can and you we share never who it st- is? Can you no, share I who won't. It is? I, I won't. And we never stopped him. And so now every time we see this coach, he walks over and he's like, Hey, Kevin. He goes, Great to see you, Paul. That's what he, he called Tony Paul the whole time. Um, and we and have by a the relationship way, for 20 and, years. And, and by the way, this coach still finished in our top three, kind yeah. of across the board. Yeah. Like, great dude. And, and so, you know, you, you get all these stories and you meet all these people and you go through it, but you also learn so much about your building. I remember one coach who we interviewed was not the same one, asked us a question and he goes, hey, when I get in your building after you hire me, who am I going to find out is the problem that you didn't tell me about? Yeah, good question. And it blew us all away. And we actually left that meeting. We all kind of stumbled our way through the answer because you don't want to like yeah. kill someone there. And we wound up making two changes the following week as a result of that question. Yeah, if you have a unanimous answer, that person's toxic like, for the building. But that's thanks like, for putting you know, a mirror on us. Yeah, correct. like we, but like, and those are the elements I think when you have a coaching search and you make a GM change that you actually have to be pretty introspective about. Like, are you setting the next coach up for success, or are you just hoping that they're a miracle worker who can fix everything that was wrong before? No, usually the issue is in your building, and the coach is emblematic of that more than it's just the coach themselves. You you mentioned the, the Spago story, which might be legendary lore in our circles, but the listener might not know it. Can you share us the Spago story? Yeah, so so we go to Spago, and, uh, which is a restaurant in Beverly Hills. Um, Wolfgang Pock is the owner, chef, famous, you know, one of probably the first star celebrity you know, chef. chef. Yeah. And, and so he comes by the table and he knows Stan pretty well. Um, and he goes, Stan, we got to hire a coach, you know, who are we hiring? I'm so excited. I'm such a fan. And Sean's sitting right there. And he, he's like, Oh, Marshall Falk. That's great. Nice to meet you. He's looking at Sean. Like he's the intern. And <laughs> you know, he's asking, he's like, he's like, I hear we may get any rattles off a bunch of big names. Yeah. And like, and Sean's sitting right there, probably shrinking back in his chair, you know? And so we're just kind of laughing. We go through it. Uh, Fergie and Josh Duhamel come walking by Yeah. We're like, Hey, who are we going to hire? Like and he Shawn's at the table. Has he, already been, at the, has he already accepted the job or no? No, we haven't even offered it to him. This okay, is like so, his final interview. Oh my so, God. I've been in these rooms where, everyone, where everyone's looking at everyone else, but you, I understand where Sean's feeling yeah. here. <laughs> you know, and you know, so we go through this night and then, you know, Sean tells the story even better than anybody, but we get to the end of the night, like Sean crushes it. Yeah. So we go to the hotel, he and Stan are staying across the street and he's expecting Stan to be like, Hey, you crushed it. You're my guy. Like, let's go do this. And Stan's like, all right, great. I'll see you tomorrow. Like, yeah, no, no Sean, insurance. No, no insurance. And Sean, Sean wakes up the next day and he's like, he's laying in bed. He's like, you know, you got a good job in Washington. You're a coordinator. And the rest is, is history. And, you know, so grateful to have him. But, you know, I, I still, it's hard for me to believe that was seven years ago. It's crazy. Cause you like know, yesterday, I remember being in Atlanta because I was doing a playoff game, Seahawks versus Falcons. I was the sideline reporter. And I remember talking to Sean from his vantage point. 
going into those meetings. And I think you guys had him staying at like the Four Seasons in Westlake Village, maybe, or it was maybe the Chateau Mormont. It was some fancy hotel. And he was impressed because he's like, they told me I could order anything from room service for free. <laughs> and I'm like, I love this about you. Like you're he's 30 years old, never been treated like this. And like you guys really rolled out the red carpet, but he had no idea he was getting offered that job. No, I mean, I think he knew he had crushed it both times. And there, there's no one more self-confident in a positive way than Sean McVay. But, you know, you got to go convince the owner who's like, I'm really going to go trust the future of my franchise in L.A. This bet that I've made, SoFi Stadium, moving a team on a 30-year-old. And, you know, I would say the, the history of the Rams can be written by Stan Kroenke making the two biggest bets in the NFL the past decade. Hey, I'm going to go build a stadium in L.A. and go for it. I'm going to go hire a 30 year old head coach. And, you know, we we're fortunate enough to hoist a Lombardi trophy in SoFi Stadium, Super Bowl 56. You know, those two bets came to fruition. I said to start this thing, you're the 30,000 foot guy for me. You look at the entire league as a whole, but you also know pretty much every piece of the organization. Here's a question I have when these coaches are interviewing and they say, Yeah, my defensive coordinator is going to be this guy, and my offensive coordinator is going to be that guy. How, is there a budget for that? Or is it like, how does that work with a team? Or is that team specific? I know it's very in the weeds, but as these coaches are all interviewing right now, they come in with a plan, but maybe the 20 year defensive coach has a different price tag than the assistant who is, you know, three years into his NFL career. Well, the really funny part is if you do 10 of these, eight of them say their defensive coordinator is going to be the same guy. Same guy, right? <laughs> right. So you, you do the meet, you do the interview in the morning and they're like, you know, Hey, you know, Raheem Morris is going to be my defensive coordinator. And you're like, okay, like, I kind of like Raheem. Like, that's a great addition. Then you do the interview the next day and like, hey, and I've talked to Raheem Morris. He wants to be my DC. And then you realize it's all, you know, that part you have to throw out. Like, and, and even now when I advise coaches to interview, I'm like, don't, don't talk about names. Cause you don't know if you can get them, the salaries, the budgets, the competition. They go talk about your vision for what you want each coach to be, Hey, my defensive coordinator, do they play an attacking style? Are they blitzing or do they play more, you know, three, four, four, three, you know, offense, are we a play action team? Are we a deep shot team? Are we a run heavy team? And then say the guys who fit that are this, you know, walk through, you know, your vision for each coaching position because the names, you know, you might get enamored with a name, yeah. whether the coach can deliver them or not, you have no clue. Uh -huh. And, you know, especially, you know, you might make the last hire, you might, hire someone after the Super Bowl and that coach has said, you know, Hey, I can't wait. I got to take a sure thing. Um, that's really the hard part. You know, when you go through these conversations, now I will remember, you know, when Sean interviewed, he said, well, Hey, he Wade, Phil who, Wade Phillips, was Wade, guy, right? Wade Phillips is going to be, so we called Wade Phillips, you know, <laughs> during the break. Is, is he for, or is he real? <laughs> is, is Sean Fuller, and he's like, Oh no, Wade loves Sean. You know, he'd love to go. And, and sure enough, like I, it's a great credit to Sean and where he was at 30, he got everybody he listed. And, but you know, that so many staff times, was who it was Wade, it was Joe Barry, it was, it was an uh, offense, Ma the floor first Ma or no? Yeah, Matt LaFleur yep. uh, was Zach the Taylor, or he came on after Zach, Zach Taylor was our assistant wide receivers coach. Think about that. Yeah. So that staff had Shane Waldron was our tight ends coach. The OC was, in Seattle right now. No, yep. the OC. Aaron Cromer was the line coach. Now the OC, you know, kind of the assistant OC in, in Buffalo. Then you had Matt LaFleur. Um, trying to think of QB coach was uh, Greg Olson, who's now, yep. who's now in Seattle and went on to become the Raiders, you know, OC. Under I Gruden, mean, yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, just that staff, you know, on the offense, they've all gone on to, you know, to great things. But you think about like our basically quality control coach is now one of the best head coaches in the NFL and, and Zach Taylor. And then you go to defense, you had, you know, Joe Barry, you had Wade Phillips, Bill Johnson, Aubrey Pleasant, uh, Ajiro Evero, you know, I mean, just, like great, great staff and out of the gates. We, That's such a I, test. I mean, think about John, that. This is a 30 and, year old coach and convinced John Fossil to stay, which was, you know, a great, you know, someone who had been the interim coach who had great opportunities. So like 30 year old coach put together a great staff, but you know, everybody's got a budget for assistant coaches. You don't, re it's, but it's kind of like a salary cap, right? No matter what it is, you're going to pay the most, get, go get the defensive coordinator. Hey, maybe I won't spend as much on the linebackers coach. Go get the OC tight ends coach, I can fudge a little bit, you know, it, it is no different than that. You know, you, you go with the people that are the foundational pieces and, and you want to make sure you get the coach, you know, everything you can. And, and like all budgets, you know, they usually go over sheepishly and, and you kind of just let them do it. It's no secret that uh, 
Sean's a friend and I've been a fan of Sean's. There's no secret that guys like Kingsbury and Sala and Hackett, I've got great relationships with. But if there's one guy in the league that I'm rooting to have success and get another shot at a head coaching position, it's your current defensive coordinator, Raheem Morris. I see that he's been asked to interview at a few places. Uh, you see Ra every single day there in the building. Make the case for Raheem Morris, NFL head coach. One of the best leaders and culture builders I've ever been around. Wow. And and I was with Raheem in Tampa. Um, but this is the guy who makes your building better. He's the glue guy who brings everybody together, your equipment staff, your training staff, your PR, the building. And the guy can coach. Like, and I, I think, you know, I start with the culture and, you know, leader because, you know, that's what you see every day. I look at this year's defense, you know, PFF had us rated 39th, I think, on defense coming into the year. You know, everybody just killed, you know, we had national media show up to camp and like it's like major league like who are, who these, are guys? these guys willie mason you know, in the outfield yeah yeah, yeah the groundskeeper is sitting there you know <laughs> you know can't say it you know <laughs> you know these guys are blank you know and you know it's aaron donald and 10 nobodies and we come out of the gate and we shut out seattle in the second half holding 13 points and you know we've had five shutout halves this year i think the defense finished 17th 18th made impact plays brought i mean kobe turner should win defensive rookie of the year you know, nine sacks from an interior position, third round pick. Byron Young, number two in sacks as an outside linebacker. Both rookies, you know, unbelievable. Both rookies are starting Darian Kendrick and Russ Yeast at safety. I mean, Christian Roseboom, guys we had hopes for, but nobody's heard, Sure. you know, of these guys and turn them into a unit. And, you know, look, where I get frustrated, and this isn't a knock, uh, I'm a big Brandon Staley fan. Mm-hmm. And Brandon did an amazing job for us in 2020, you know, led the league in defense. Um, you know, but we go to the playoffs, and we give up 500 yards to Green Bay in the divisional round. And we get 44 slips for Brandon Staley as head coach, and he can have his pick of jobs in 2021. Mm-hmm. Raheem Morris wins the Super Bowl, you know, nine sacks in the second half. Yep. You know, we have this year, and you're fighting to get people to interview. And, you know, to me, that's just where the system, you know, is a little bit broken in, in our world. And you get in a room with Raheem, and he was fortunate enough to get pretty deep with the Colts you know, last year, but he has a vision for how he wants to play football, how he wants to lead. You know, I, w- I left Tampa the year he got the head coaching job. And, you know, I would say he took that team to 10 wins and with Josh and 20, Freeman with, and a bunch of with, guys, no one knew. And they went 10 with, games. And, you know, from 2008 until Tom Brady showed up, that franchise never won double digits. Mm. Raheem Morris had their only double digit season. He goes to Atlanta as the interim coach. You know, does a great job. Beat, I think, holds Patrick Mahomes to his lowest total, you know, of the year during interim. Remember that in Arrowhead, yeah, in, in, in Arrowhead. And so I think you you have this dynamic coach, you know, who who has learned under, and not to say Sean McVay, Kyle Shanahan, Dan Quinn, Mike Tomlin, John Gruden, Monty Jay Kiffin. Gruden. I mean, Jay. I mean, like Mike Shanahan. Like he has been with the pantheon, you know, of coaches. He'll he'll go crush it. You know, Kyle Shanahan says if he had, if you were telling an owner the first person. I saw this. So like, I'll be honest. The, the quote was, if an owner was to ask me, the first person who they should hire as a head coach is Raheem Morris. And that's not a staff member on his team. Um, I saw Mike Tomlin came out and had a very public yeah. statement about, yeah. you're talking about the luminaries of the NFL right now. McVay, yeah, and, Shanahan, and Tomlin all say that he's the guy. So what, what are we doing? <laughs> yeah, no. And I think that to me is, you know, I'm hopeful this cycle and, but look, let's also be honest. He's got an amazing opportunity Sunday night. Ben Johnson mm-hmm. right now is the cream of the crop. $15 Hottest, million you know, dollar man. And, you know, so, you know, I am hopeful, and not just that we go win the game, but what a great opportunity for us as a team to go in, but it's certainly also for, for Raheem, for, for this defense to go have a shot at, you know, one of the hottest coordinators. And, and I am hopeful that that will be, you know, just, one case for him that the people can make uh coming out of sunday night and you know i i am hopeful you know son we walk you know off that field at ford field on sunday that everybody says raheem morris is the guy i gotta have as our head coach i love that i'm gonna wrap with you soon but i've got a couple other things for you i hope that's okay can we just write yeah, no. a couple more things i love this rapid um, fire let's go let's go but more of this being a pitch to hollywood studios and to a very saturated sports doc community i mean i don't there might not be a sports story that hasn't had a documentary made about it in the last five years streamers hello uh 
Kevin, we have talked about this stage in your career where you you jumped at a entrepreneurial opportunity in the boom of the internet in your early to mid 20s. Can you explain the story and the pool of talent that you had around you and you guys just being a little early on what feels like what could have been the Facebook of sports? Yeah, I know. So my first job out of college was a company called Broadband Sports, um, which was, I would say today it would be an amalgamation of The Athletic, Bleacher Report, SB Nation, Roto World, and maybe the Players Tribune. So we had a bunch of player websites. So you could go to, you know, Kobe Bryant.athletesdirect.com. Um, we did, we built team websites for the Cowboys and the Raiders, which is one of the ways I got my introduction in the NFL. You know, we, we built home pages for if you went to go look up Los Angeles Rams on AOL. That was all of our, our work and, and our content. You know, we did you tried have a to staff hire... that would like that would write the articles or it was you guys. We did a that? little bit and we outsourced and we, you know, AP. But like I remember we tried to hire Adam Schefter from the Denver Post. I remember him. Right? Coming in. Oh, yeah. From, you know, from the offices. And, you know, we, we wound up doing all of these crazy things. And so this was based know, what... out of LA. It was an Internet company and it would yeah, make and... individual sites. But were you guys licensed by the NFL or it was all well, just. So we of... were getting licensed by the NFL and by the Players Association and. You know, this is the time when we did the Cowboys, we paid them for the right to do their website with this idea that, you know, we would go sell, you know, merchandise and ads and content around it. And, you know, this is the height of the dot com boom. So I was the 30th employee in what year is um, this? 1999. I love um, this, dude. All right. And, you know, three months, you know, four months later, we're in brand new offices in Santa Monica. We're 300 employees. We're the number two IPO on Wall Street uh, <laughs> behind Krispy Kreme. You know? Um, and I think I turned down a job and you and I've talked at Fox sports yep. and they gave me an extra like 50,000 shares. And I'm thinking this is the greatest thing on earth. Uh, I want to believe who's at this crew in broadband. No. So, and it wound up being, you know, Mark Silverman who now helps run Fox went to the big 10 yep. network was, was one of my bosses, uh, John Collins who went on to the NFL and now I think owns the Islanders, you know, was one, you know, you can kind of go through the list of, of talent um, that have shown up in, in all kinds of crazy places. Uh, I left three months later, there were 300 people. Nine months later, they were out of business. So tell me but, how it goes down because everyone knows pets.com, but like literally how does yeah, it bust? Yeah, you know, well, I remember, so we get the AOL deal and they, they pull us into this. We had this big fancy room called the athletes lounge that they had built that no athletes ever went into, but it, it was a really cool space. <laughs> Hypothetically, uh, there was beanbag yeah, chairs and a yeah, ping pong uh, yeah, table. Correct. Um, <laughs> And they do this meeting, they're like, hey, and I had kind of worked on this secret project on team pages for a while. And they said, hey, AOL is going to take our content. And I remember walking out next to some guy and I'm like, I'm 22. I was a history major. I'm like, I don't know anything about business. I'm like, oh, how much is AOL paying us? They're like, no, we're paying them 17 million a year for the right to do this. I go, why? We're doing all the work. That, that, was, make my, sense. that was my first hint that, you know, hey, th this may not be, you know, the soundest financial model. So, <laughs> you know, you know, we're, we're right up there with pets.com. And so. You know, my my hundred thousand shares that I have, you know, are worth as much of, you know, as those bobbleheads behind you. <laughs> I always tell anybody breaking the sports, go to the minor leagues because you'll get to do everything mm. and you'll learn. There is almost not a thing that happens at the Los Angeles Rams right now that I didn't do in my time between the arena league or, or Tampa or now at the Rams. So I would say it's the best training ground because rather than going to a big brand where you talk about what someone else did that you that you helped do a small part of, you actually got to do the thing and you can talk about your experience. Uh, real quick, rapid fire. We'll do just quick questions and then we'll get you out of here. Uh, the first one here, Super Bowl ride, your most fondest memory, the thing that if you wake up in the middle of the night and you just smile, what was it? Which one? The, the one we won? The one you won. Yeah, uh, you're hoisting a Lombardi. Super Bowl ride, uh, Cooper Cup's catch. In Tampa? Against in Tampa. Because I mean, we're ahead 27 3, mm. right? I mean, almost, you know, 20. And I get all these texts. They show the, the owner suite at halftime, and I look nervous as shit. Yeah. And everybody's like, You're up 23. Like, be happy, look better. And I'm like, We're playing Tom Brady. Yep. Right? Like, there is no world in which you're ever going to feel good. We get up 27 3, and you're like, Okay, like, we got this. And then they just, you know, we, Cooper Cup fumbles can't like that never happens. He's winning, and you blow the whole thing. 
and they score and it's 27 all and the place is rock and you're like oh my god and matthew stafford and cooper cup connect on a bomb and you know i think you go to enough games in your life where there's time you can always tell from the arc of a pass whether it's going to be caught yeah. like you can do the geometry in your head yeah. and you're like oh my god like oh my god and, you know we it. get it you know we get it we you know we we throw the ball down. And you're like, we're actually going to go win this game in regulation, which you thought I had no prayer. Um, you kick the field goal and you get in the locker room and just crazy. And one of the cool things about, you know, so that play and then SoFi Stadium and knowing because we already knew the Niners are one, we were coming back from the NFC Championship game. You may know the SoFi Stadium is basically an LED screen. So yeah. on the plane home, you fly right over SoFi Stadium. We had on the roof, we ran the loop of the Stafford to cup pass oh, that's awesome. for our players to see as they flew in, you know, back to LA for, you know, kind of the NFC championship. So I, you know, I remember that, you know, I remember the tip pass that, that won it against, you know, the, the Niners, you yeah. know, all, all, all of that, but to, to win an NFC championship against your, you know, most bitter rival and to win a Super Bowl in your own building, it's all, it's all there, but the Cooper cup pass for sure. You're in LA. A lot of celebrity fans come to these games. Uh, maybe the most surprising or you know best celebrity story is coming to SoFi, whether it be Super Bowl week or whether it be any regular season game that you've had a chance to interact with. That you're just like, what is going on here? You know, Super Bowl was crazy, and you know that regard, and you kind of get used to. Um, I would say a couple of weeks ago we had Shohei Otani for yeah. his first game and like a Thursday night game, right? Thursday night game, and you bring him in the locker room, and he's hanging with the players and you know, just how wide eyed he was. And this guy's probably the greatest athlete on the planet right now. I mean, it'd be like if Patrick Mahomes and Micah Parsons were the same player. Yeah. Like, like, I mean, you try to think about that, you know, and, you know, so then you, you get to, you know, all of the entertainers and the fun. And then, you know, you also get to, you know, the silly things from our generation when, you know, the Sarah Michelle Geller show up and you're like, <laughs> You, you know, you're like, yeah, you're like teenage Kevin's fired up right now. Yeah, you know, it's awesome. you know, it's like when, so, when Debbie Gibson tweeted at me. Yes. Yeah. You know, but you know, what's so funny. I mean, you talk about memories. I remember we had Warren G play halftime of yeah. our wild card game against Arizona. Plays the regular? Stadium, the stadium's rocking. Yeah. Right. And this is before the NFL has done their crazy halftime show, which was awesome. But, you know, you, you just L.A. is a special place when you get it rolling, you know, but you still Magic Johnson, Kareem, you know, the athletes still always, you know, LeBron, they always do well in LA too. All right. Last one. And it's two pronged underappreciated player on the Los Angeles Rams and then underappreciated person in our NFL world that you think deserves some shout out on this podcast. <laughs> uh, underappreciated player on the Los Angeles Rams. I'm going to go with two each side of the ball. Uh, Rob Havenstein, okay. you know, our right tackle who has been one of the foundational pieces. And you know, he's one of the only guys to have started a Super Bowl with both Jared and Matthew. Like he's just, since we drafted him in 2015, you know, the rock and we're so young on the offensive line. You got Alaric Jackson undrafted third year, Steve Avila first year, Coleman Shelton's third or fourth year, Kevin Dotson's in his fourth year. I mean, Rob Havenstein yeah. is that glue. Young. I mean, we're, I think we're the second, you had that great stat about the Packers yeah. on good morning football. I think we're the second or third youngest team in football, you know? So Rob Havenstein is kind of that glue of the offense, you know, certainly the offense line. And then I tell you, the Ernest Jones, mm. um, third year linebacker broke the great franchise in the Super record. Bowl. That great in the Super Bowl. You know, when you talk about someone who handles that we signed Bobby Wagner, which kind of lessened his role last year, but I think in terms of, and this is a great life lesson. And I want to say for all millennials and Gen Z, because that's, you know, painting with wide brushes, you know, has a sack and a tip pass in the Super Bowl, knocks away a fourth down ball. We bring in Bobby Wagner, who takes a back seat. Huh. You bring in him, but he learns so much from Bobby Wagner as a mentor, as a leader. And you see that paying dividends. I love that. This, this year. And I think for all of us who get jobs young, you, hey, I'm the man, I can do this. Like, it's great to have mentors. Being able to take a step back, take a lesser role, watch someone, I mean, you want, you're not going to find a better human being on this earth than Bobby Wagner. I could answer your second question, you know, with, with a Bobby, you know, Wagner shout out. Um, mm. But, uh, you know, to me, you know, Ernest Jones has been, you know, the heartbeat of this defense is, is our signal caller and the lifeblood and, and just someone I, you love watching grow each day in his third year. 
I love it. All right. Now in our world, in the NFL, could be another player, could be another coach, could be a league employee, could be an employee at the Rams, someone that maybe doesn't get enough love. And you say, Hey, this guy is really good. Or this gal is really good at what they do. Look, I'm not going to say uh, anybody at the Rams. Cause I'd have to go 300 deep, you yeah. know, there, you know, I love all my children equally. Um, sure. And, you know, so you know, I love all our employees equally. I- I'm going to go off the radar NFL league office, Dave Gardy. Talk about Gardy. You know, one of the, the bedrock has been there forever. You know, someone who knows the rule book inside out when, you know, when you're angry and pissed off on a Monday and, you know, you want to complain about an officiating or something that the league did, Dave gets the call from all of us and he mm-hmm. handles it with such grace. Right. I mean, I can't think of someone who's MF more on an, on a weekly <laughs> basis than, than Dave Gardy. And he just, he handles it so well. He represents everything that's great about the NFL. And I, you've had Mike North on yeah. all the time. I mean, the choice words I gave Mike North Sunday from the locker room in, in San Francisco, when they were debating Saturday night or Sunday night for, for our game, mm. you know, we, we, we've said, you know, a couple of times on this podcast, that's nowhere near what that I was, was yelling. That was, yeah. that was very you know, or, or actually like, when we got our schedule in May and I'm yelling at Mike North, like, Dave Gardy gets that on a weekly basis from all 32 of us. You know, he's the person who shows up at game operations. He leads the competition committee, you know, meetings. He works closely with Troy Vincent, just one of those good guys in the NFL who never gets, gets any recognition. And you and I talk about this all the time. You know, one of the things that I, I dislike the most about the NFL is that, you know, one man's downfall is another man's opportunity. And I think that mm-hmm. makes us, you know, a lot catty. And, you know, always looking, you know, what team, who's getting fired and does that mean yeah. there's an opportunity? Have you heard if they, are they canning their coach? Yeah. Okay. Well, if so, you know, yeah. we need to be better cheerleaders of, of each other, you know, at all 32 franchises and, you know, the league office. And when, when I say something like that, like Dave, you know, there's so many good people at other teams who deserve shout outs, but Dave Gardy is the first one that comes to mind for me. I love that. Let's wrap with this. I always do this on the podcast. You have a, uh, an elevator ride at the combine or the senior bowl or you name it the league meetings in west palm or arizona and a young man or woman comes in with a resume and a manila folder and they're a junior in college or they're a sophomore in law school or they're just off the street and they heard that there's a big nfl event and this is their opportunity and you get in this elevator and the elevator closes and the young man or woman looks at you and says I'll do anything to get in the NFL. What is your advice? And you have just the elevator elevator ride to share with them. What is your elevator advice for this young yeah. man or woman? Yeah, uh, my advice is always the same. You know, major in whatever you want because it doesn't matter, right? You don't have to be a sports management, sports business major. If you you want to major in Greek philosophy, be my guest. Like, go be the best version. The first version people see of you all the time is email. Make sure your email is well-written, clear, concise. That's how 95% of the world's going to judge you when you're a first. And it's not when, like Polo Sport Girl 11. Yeah, or correct. it's Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, and, you know, go make sure Yankees that that's at gmail.com. Yeah. You know, go volunteer at your university in yeah. the football office at the athletic department. Don't just tell me you'll do anything. Show me that you've gone work. And I don't care if you go work, you know, selling tickets for sure you know women's soccer or if you're the right hand to the head football coach like that doesn't matter to me i want to see you do that so i can go talk to someone about your work ethic and your drive and then finally if you truly love the nfl there's so many great ways whether it's over the cap or pff or all these sites now you can go learn some of that trade and you know you can go do it start a blog start a podcast like there's so many ways when you and i were coming up that you that you couldn't do this. No. And, and I don't say that, and I'm not going to read your stuff and say like, oh, you have this amazing insight about the offensive line and we're going to go hire you. I just want to know how you think. Yeah. I want to see that you can put it all together, you know, and have that initiative and, and look, be, be bold, be creative. And look, if you decide I want to go work, you know, at a factory or at a tech company or Wall Street, it doesn't mean a 22 your path is, you know, if you don't get in football, if you don't go to sports, it's not driven. Go do what you're passionate about. You will find your way to where you should be. Like, be patient, you know, be optimistic, and, you know, don't just take any job. Take the one you really want. Kevin, this is awesome. President of the Los Angeles Rams, uh, 
on the biggest week uh, of the Rams season and certainly the most dramatic wildcard game in a few days. I so appreciate you taking the hour and change to sit with me. Uh, you're great at what you do. And obviously uh, we so appreciate your time, dude.